hope to see you all again next week. And next week's speaker is um, our very own Tom Flamson, who recently got his PhD here at UCLA, and is now at the Santa Monica uh, Department of Earth Science. And his talk is entitled, Encryption Theory, the Evolution of Humor as an Honest Signal. And um, this week's talk is um, Errol Ache. Ache. Um, yeah. And he's going to be talking today from the University of Tennessee National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, and he's going to be talking about motivations and behavioral responses. Welcome. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I had a very uh, pleasurable day so far. Uh, even the drive out from, uh, drive out from uh, Riverside was, wasn't too bad. So, um, and, <clears throat> and I'm coming from uh, um, Tennessee. Uh, I'm, I'm a postdoc at the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, which looks like it should be pronounced NIMBIOS, but we call it NIMBUS. Um, and it's a, it's a new center uh, funded by NSF, uh, and it's similar to uh, Nescent and ANSYS that, you, that is in Santa Barbara, uh, but it's uh, focused on mathematical and biology, the interface on mathematics and biology. And um, <coughs> so if you have questions about the center, I'd be happy to answer them too. Um, or you can, you're welcome to shoot me an email. And I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, evolution of uh, motivations and behavior responses today, and, uh, and present uh, two models um, that um, seek to integrate uh, what is commonly known, referred to as, as proximate and ultimate causes of behavior. Okay, so by way of uh, just uh, setting up, um, there's a lot of the social evolution theory, a lot of the uh, thinking about evolution of social behavior is focused on the evolution of cooperation because because it's a behavior that we know is ubiquitous in nature. Um, you, here are all these different uh, instances of cooperative behaviors that you can observe. Uh, here's uh, this, these are uh, Alan's uh, swamp, mo swamp monkeys um, and uh, some uh, blue tits and uh, uh, parental care. Uh, here you see an acacia tree with, uh, um, you, might, you might be able to see the thorns, swollen thorns, which house ant, ant colonies and the ants defend the tree. And, and this is the root of a, of a legume plant. Uh, and these things are called nodules and they house uh, rhizobia that fix nitrogen for the plant. So uh, all these interactions throughout nature uh, where, where either individuals within a species or individuals with dif from different species provide some benefits to each other and, and cooperate to um, that you mutually beneficial outcomes is, and, and is, is a focus of a lot of study. And there's a lot of, there, are, there are a lot of different explanations being proposed for uh, why cooperation is stable, why, how cooperation is maintained in, in nature. And, and some of these explanations are, um, are based on behavioral responses. So things like uh, reciprocity. If I help someone, th that someone is like more likely to help me back, so that maintains cooperation. There can be kin selection where, you, uh, where cooperating individuals actually provide benefits to their relatives, um, that which ends up uh, increasing the frequency of the genes that make them cooperate um, because they get, they get passed on by through the relatives. Um, then you, get, you, you have more kind of uh, ecological theories of um, things like partner fidelity feedback where partners stay together for a long time, so it's actually in your own interest to help your partner because if they survive, you survive as well. Um, and that's certainly the case in many plant mutualisms. Or um, somewhat related to, to, to reciprocity, there's the idea of partner sanctions when you uh, actually punish non-cooperators for not uh, being uh, cooperative and so on. So all these explanations have been proposed and there's a lot of evidence for many of them in different species. And, <coughs> and people have been um, trying to make sense of all this diversity for a long time and, and of diversity of behavior. And, Usually, people dis distinguish between proximate and ultimate causation of behavior, um, and and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this terminology. So just to you know set some, um, uh, just to define them, the proximate causes are the, the actual mechanism of behavior, the immediate cause of behavior, what makes an animal do this or that, and that could be based on hormone circuit, the hormone levels in the blood, or it could be the the neural circuitry that the animal has, and so on. And the ultimate cause is basically. It, at least in, in evolution theory, is the, uh, the, what, what is the fitness consequence of behavior and how does selection act on uh, this behavioral trait. And the usual argument that you hear in the literature is that the, the proximate causation, the proximate questions, questions about the proximate causes are different than ultimate questions, and they need to be considered separately. But they, they can interact, and, and both are worthwhile to study, but 
but they are separate questions. And and what I what I would submit here uh, is at least for theory on the theoretical side of the things, um, there has been much more emphasis on the separation of these two uh, levels of causation, and and also much more emphasis on the ultimate cause. And uh, and this is I. I think that's the, the, the pattern that is true in the, in the theoretical behavioral ecology literature or social evolution literature. So uh, for, as an example for, for this pattern, uh, here are two uh, recent quotes from uh, people who are prominent on, in, these, in these fields. So Trivers, uh, in the foreword of uh, his uh, uh, collected papers, uh, says you, you begin with the effect of behavior on actors and recipients, and then you, you, you kind of leave the problem of internal motivation as a secondary problem and you don't deal with it at first because because that's why how to do an anal evolution analysis and in, in another paper that uh, Stu West and colleagues and it's uh, then a paper that's that's I think appearing in, in evolution and human behavior they say they have a table of many misconceptions about the evolution of human cooperation and one of them is that you know there's this mixing up between proximate and ultimate explanations and they they want to disabuse, disabuse the readers from this notion by saying proximate answers cannot provide a solution to the ultimate problem. And this is in response to mainly uh, uh, to models by Herb Gintis and, and colleagues um, to explain human cooperation by strong reciprocity. I'm not going to go into that debate. We can go into the discussion if you want. But this is th th that's their point. The, the proximate answer is not a, an answer to the ultimate question. Okay. And then, so here's my take for what it's worth. Um, so I, I, I do agree that the proximate versus ultimate distinction is a very logically sound distinction, um, but I don't think that we, it follows from that that we can we, we can or we should separate the two levels of ex explanation for uh, meaningful biological analysis, and then that leads to, to my talk's central thesis, if you will, which is uh, every model of ultimate causation by necessity uh, is kind of logically implies a model of proximate causation. So how, you know, if we do a model of behavior, you sort of do either, either implicit or explicit assumptions about how that behavior is, how that behavior comes about, is implemented. And, and I'm going to say, I'm going to submit that it pays to be explicit about these proxies mechanisms and integrate them into your evolutionary thinking. And uh, so, so then, by implication, this is, we need a theory that integrates ultimate and proximate causation. And, and that frequently involves the uh, modeling, the behavioral dynamics of an interaction, the dynamics that happen at the behavioral time scale, uh, together with the action of natural selection, and so so I'm going to present two models that do just that, and um, and that give rise to different uh, 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 conclusions to that uh, as um, from what you would expect from just pu purely considering the evolution model, and. Uh, and, and the two models is one of them is going to be the, the evolution of social motivations, in particular other regarding motivations in a model where, you, where there is behavioral dynamics going on at the fast time scale, um, and then evolution dynamics happening over generations. And the other one will be a general framework to integrate behavioral responses um, together with uh, you know, well-known models of kin selection and group, group selection, and selection in structured groups, basically, structured populations. Okay. So here's a short outline. Um, so I'm first going to talk about, the, in the first part, the evolution of other regarding motivations, um, and then talk about the proximate causation, model for proximate causation based on uh, motivations, and, uh, and then look at how the other regarding motivations evolve, and, and look at the cases where, which favor or, or, um, or which, which favor other regard versus not. Uh, in the different social interactions that may favor other regarding interactions more than others. In part two, I'm going to uh, go for a general model for uh, selection in structured population where individuals also respond to each other uh, behaviorally and within the behavioral time scale. And then I'm going to ask, in such a, uh, in such a setting, what does it take for um, group optimal behavior to evolve? And group optimality is this notion of for, you know, behaving for the good of the group. And, uh, and that's kind of the original source of the group selection controversy. And, uh, and, and I'm going to focus on, uh, specifically on the interaction between relatedness and behavioral responses. Okay. And I should mention at this point that um, both of these models are, are, we, I've done with my collaborator, Jer Jeremy Van Cleve, who's uh, currently at the Santa Fe Institute and who looks very happy in this picture. So um, to acknowledge his contributions to this work. 
So, um, okay, here's the here's a, here's a biological question we are, we are asking. So, other regarding motivations, which we can define and as an, as an intrinsic motivation to increase another individual's welfare, even if it's costly to, your, to oneself. Um, and, and, and we know that, uh, that other regarding motivations or things that, something that looks like other regarding motivation exist in, in, many, in, some, in many different species. And here are some examples and some from the literature. So humans, a lot of anecdotal evidence. This is Angela Jolie, by the way, uh, helping some uh, charity uh, in Pakistan, I think. Uh, so humans, you know, uh, display other regarding behavior lots of times. Capuchin monkeys, uh, they've been, uh, there's been lab, ex lab experience showing that they, suggesting that they do have other regarding motivations, marmosets, and, uh, and, and finally chimpanzees, although there's, there's, you know, arguments on both sides on chimpanzees, so it's, it's not as, um, it's not very clear whether they do have other regarding motivations or not. So the question I want to ask is, can other regarding motivations evolve? Would you expect them to evolve? if you didn't have king selection or group selection, um, whatever they, that they are. So if you don't have any related, relatedness factoring into the selection uh, equations. Okay. And, and what, sure. What, what do you mean by group selection? Do you mean king selection? So, <laughs> good question. Uh, any, any selection, you know, not, any selection that's not individual level selection, basically. Um, and, and you, some types of group selection is equivalent to king selection, so and sometimes some types of group selection is not, and I don't have any either of them. So <laughs> um, in the model, so I'm kind of excluding any effect of relatedness, any any, any effect of structured population in the in the um, in in this model, and there's some more subtlety involved, but we can discuss we can discuss that afterwards. Okay, so so this is my question. Um, and, and for, to answer that question, as you would expect from, from my introduction, I'm going to take a model of motivations as approximate cause and natural selection as the ultimate cause, and then build an integrated model where these two feed back into each other. Okay. So here's a social setting. Uh, so you can imagine two capuchin monkeys, uh, and you can give them two different food sources. So let's say uh, you give one of them apples and the other one carrots. Okay. And so they both would like to have uh, sugars that are in the apples and uh, the, the beta carotenes that are in the, in, the, in, the, in the carrots, so they both need two different nutrients, so, so, but each one, each one only has one of them. So, so they could actually increase their own payout, their payout by exchanging some of this food, uh, by donating some of their food to each, to, to each other. So, so I'm going to label um, their, 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 their actions, how much they donate by A1 and A2, and A1 is basically just the quantity that individual 1 donates to individual 2, and A2 is the quantity that individual 2 donates to individual 1. Okay. And then as a result of these um, actions, they accrue some, some payoff, which is just the material payoff the benefit they get, uh, which is, for example, um, how much they grow at the end of the day, given how many apples they have, how many carrots they have. Okay. And the payoffs I'm going to denote by U uh, and U1 is the payoff for individual 1 and U2 is the payoff for individual 2 and, and, but they're, they, they are material payoffs so they're, they're, it's, not, you know, the, it's not the utility if you will, it's the material pay, it's the actual payoff okay. so, and, and in such an interaction you, you, can, you can think of the conflict of interest that's built into this interaction so with the payoff to, where, where the payoff of into each individual basically you can express it as, a, as the benefit some benefit function from receiving donation, receiving food from another guy, minus some cost of, of donating to the other guy because you don't have that food to eat for yourself. And, and so here are some example cost and benefit functions. Uh, the benefit function is increasing, for, as you can see, in, in how much donation you get, but it's, it has a saturating form because to get, if apples become less worth, you know, the marginal value of apples become less if you have a lot of apples. Uh, whereas the cost actually is increasing, um, in, in the marginal cost is actually increasing because if you have very few apples, then it's actually you need that remaining apple all that much more. So, so then you can get a unique optimal uh, donation level from this. But but the thing to note is that you know the only way you can incre increase your, your your partner's payoff, another guy's payoff, is to do by donating more food to them. But that's costly, so that necessarily decreases your own payoff. So there's at the level of the payoffs, there is a perfect conflict of interest between these, these two individuals. Okay. 
So, and then you can also see fairly easily that uh, for any level of, for any fixed level of donation that you receive, the best thing for you to do is to donate nothing at all. So, which gives rise to the classic Prisus Lemma uh, situation. So, so the, 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 the predicted kind of selfish behavior here is for neither individual to donate anything. So, so, so then the question is why would they donate anything at all? So this is a classical cooperation problem. And, and, and here's where the proximate mechanism comes in. So, so, I'm, so as the, this little box makes it clear, this is, I'm going to talk about the proximate mechanism of behavior and I'm, specifically I'm going to talk about the model of behavior that's uh, the decision making that's goal oriented. So I'm going to assume that individuals come equipped with, uh, they, they're born with some, some, uh, some objective functions, some, some preferences uh, that tell them what to, what to do in a social interaction. And, and mathematically, I'm going to represent the objective function with the function x, x1 for individual 1 and x2 for individual 2. And the function, the x, function x is a function of a1 and a2, so what the, is, is a function of the social situation. And the way I think about it is, is that it, this, this function represents the, the internal reward sensation of the animal. So, you know, how much the reward circuitry in the, in the, in the brain of an animal uh, lights up in a, during, during a social interaction depending on how much donation it gives and how much donation it receives. And, and here's just a, a, a picture of a, a fMRI a study uh, showing the, the, how the, 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 the regions of the brain that are correlated with the, with the reward experience. Um, so basically X1 can be thought of, thought of as, as how much these neurons fire giving a social situation. And, and, and I'm going to assume that that determines the motivations of the individuals. So, so two examples, two focal length examples to, to orient ourselves here is you, you can imagine that the, the objective function, the reward sensation might be equal to the, the material payoff. So the more payoff you get, the more apples and the more carrots you have, the better you feel, the, much, the more reward you feel. And that's, so in that case, the X1 would be equal to uh, the payoff function, U1. And that, that I call selfish because that, that such an individual would try to maximize its own payoff. Okay. But you can, you can also imagine that X1 is a f actually a function of both your own payoff and your partner's payoff. And here's, a, here's an example of a simple function where the, it's a product of the two payoffs. And, and, and in, some ca in these cases, if X1 is like this, at least at, at some of the time, this individual would, be, would actually be motivi motivated to increase another individual's payoff because it will feel the reward sensation associated with that, okay? So, and then I go, I'm just going to some very, very simple behavioral dynamics where you, the individual sense their reward, sense their reward, they know the level of X1, and they know whether X1 increases or decreases when if they increase their increase their action or decrease their action. So if they donate, they know whether they would get more reward, they would feel more rewarded if they donated more or donated less. And if they if they if X1 increases when A1 increases, they they go ahead and increase A1. And if X1 decrease increases if A1 decreases, so by donating less, they go ahead and decrease A1. And and this is you can think of this as a simple you can visualize this as a simple hill climbing process. Um, if you're if you're so inclined, the the this the surface here denotes the, the objective function as a function of the actions a1 and a2, and uh, so they basically want to go up this surface all the time, but just just locally they want to adjust their actions locally, depending on whether they would feel better or not, you know, adjusting their actions up, up or down a little bit, and this is the this is the simple differential equation representation of this process, okay. And then at some point, you know, eventually they will come to some, if, if, the, if the behavioral equilibrium exists, they will come to some, some point where they don't, where, where their, motiva their reward sensation essentially doesn't change if they make small changes, adjustment to their ac actions, okay? And in that case, the, the derivative of the reward sensation, the derivative of the function x would be zero, so they would actually stay put there. They wouldn't change anything because they, given what the other guy does, that's the best they can feel, okay? And, and, and I'm, going to do, I'm going to call that point uh, the behavioral equilibrium, and I'm going to uh, denote it with, uh, by putting asterisks on, on A1 and A2. So when you have asterisks on a, the actions, it's the behavioral equilibrium. And, and the, another simplifying assumption I'm going to make is that they reach this behavioral equilibrium fairly quickly, and they stay there for a long time. Okay? And that's, that's, that's basically a very uh, convenient assumption that makes the analysis very simple. 
much simpler than it would be. Um, but, but it means that basically fitness, your, your, your reproductive success, uh, is, is equal to your payoff or proportional to your payoff at this behavioral equilibrium as, as this relation shows. So you're supposing you cannot increase your payoff if the other, uh, if the other player does not change, right? You are defining a Nash equilibrium. Yes, right? but the Nash equilibrium with respect to when, when the payoffs are, def when Nash equilibrium by the, of the game that is defined by the objective functions, not, ne not necessarily the payoffs, because the objective functions can be different than the payoffs. So, so the objective function x, right, can be different than the than the payoffs u, because because they can. The, the reward sensation can be anything, and I'm going to model how the reward sensation evolves, how how it relates to the payoffs. But yes, given given the reward sensation function, the, given the objective function x, you find the Nash equilibrium of that fun, of that game. It it probably will be clearer in a, in a minute. Also, the objective function is then homogeneous. Everyone, to get that expression, everyone has to have the same exact objective function. Yes. Well, so I'm going to I'm going to introduce different objective functions now. Yes. But so far, I'm, I haven't done anything on that. So okay. So so now, given this behavioral approximate model of behavior, uh, you can reformulate the question. Well, okay, which objective function will the, the question that we originally asked? Which, you can reformulate it as which objective function will be evolutionarily stable? Whether you know, your, your objective function will be equal to your payoffs, um, which would be the selfish objective function, or whether it's going to be some other regarding uh, objective function where it's like something like this, where it's uh, uh, the, the product of the two payoffs of the two individuals, okay? And to, to answer that question, okay, to answer that question, we first have to actually define a range of objective functions and, and, and introduce and, and look at the look at the performance of these different objective functions because so the, the objective function is just a reward sensation right it's, it doesn't actually translate into fitness by itself but it changes what the objective function does it change is that it changes the behavioral equilibrium which does affect your payoff okay so so at the end of the day what you what you take home what the, what, what these individuals uh, what determines these individuals reproductive success is their payoff but the way they arrive at the behavioral equilibrium, which determines their payoff, is through their objective functions. So, so that's why there is a link between the, uh, the, the, the objective functions you have and your actual payoff. So here's a, here's a parameterization of different, a family of objective functions, if you will, where, um, where x1 is equal to you, the product of your own payoff, payoff times your partner's payoff, but raised to a power beta, okay? And, and, and I'm going to assume that beta is a genetically determined trait. So there's a gene for beta, and, and there's variation of in, in beta in the population. And, and basically, the biological interpretation of the beta is how it determines how the rewards are encoded in the brain, how the, the, the social situation where you have you know, so many apples and so many carrots, and the other guy has so many apples and so many carrots, how they translate into your, your feeling well, your feeling reward. Okay. So, and you know, just to orient yourself uh, in, in this, uh, to the family, so if beta is zero, something, to the power, something raised to the power of zero is one, so you get the selfish objective function. And if beta is one, you get this, this product form that I've, been, um, that I've been flashing on the screen uh, for a bit, okay? And, and so, so any, any beta that is greater than zero will be other regarding because uh, these individuals will sometimes be, be motivated to increase the, their partner's payoff. Okay. So then you can write the evolutionary stability conditions for, for beta, which an evolutionary stability evolutionary stable strategy is defined by by a strategy when it's fixed in the population, it cannot be invaded by other strategies. So the mut any mutant strategy that's different than the resident one has to be has to have a fitness lower than the resident fit strategy. And and you know if you if if you make some, uh, some you know assumptions like uh, small effect mutants and, and weak selection, then that means that fitness is maximized at the evolutionary stable strategy. Okay, and this is the first order condition for for the evolutionary stable strategy, the derivative of the fitness function with respect to the evolutionary trait beta has to be equal to zero. And then you go ahead and, and plug in the behavioral equilibrium, in, because fitness w, w1 is equal to the 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 payoff at the behavioral equilibrium, 
And the behavioral equilibrium is a function of betas because it's a function of the objective functions. So you can invert the, the so you can express the uh, equilibrium actions a1 star and a2 star as a function of beta. And then you do a lot of you do some algebra, uh, and then you end up with this condition, which which is a which is a nice looking e equation, but um, so it's not a terrible equation. But I'll walk you through it. So, so here you have del u1 del a1, which is the partial delivery of your own payoff with respect to your own action. So this is how much your payoff changes, how your cha payoff changes if you change your own action. Okay. And here you have how the del u1 del a2, which is how your, pay your, your payoff changes when your, your partner changes their action. Okay. And then this, it's multiplied by this, by this fraction which basically, which depends on x2, the, your, your partner's objective function. And, and, and basically what this term describes is, this, uh, it describes what, how your partner reacts to changes in your action. Whether, if you change a1, if you increase a1 just a little bit, whether your partner increases or decreases a2, and by how much, okay, com compared to your change, okay. And so I'm going to call that the response coefficient, and I'm going to keep, you know, denote it by rho, okay. So if rho is positive, then if, I incre if, if my, my opponent's rho is positive, then that means if I donate more to, the, to my opponent, then I'm, go I'm likely to get more donations back. So on the other hand, if it's negative, if that means that if I'm donating more, he's going to donate less to me. Okay. And that's going to be important for, for the evolutionary stability. And, and here's the result. Um, and, and here's the reference. Um, so, so this is what called the, what's called a pairwise invasibility plot uh, in, uh, in evolutionary game theory. And, and this is basically taking two different uh, betas, two different strategies, and, and comparing their fitness against each other. So on the x-axis you see the, the, uh, uh, the, the beta that's resident in the population, okay? And on the y-axis you see a mutant beta that you introduce in that population. And the, in the black regions, the, the mutant beta has higher fitness than the resident beta. And on the, in the white regions, the, the resident beta has higher fitness than the mutant beta, okay? And this is the 45 degree line, okay? So what you can see from this graph is that, you know, if you're in this region, uh, the, the, the region that's above the 45 degree line is black, which means that mutants that are, that are high, of higher beta than the resident can invade. So, the, the, so if, you're, if the population is here, let's say, this population will progressively move move up, okay, because higher valued betas will, will be able to invade that population. On the other hand, if, if the population is here, then the region below, below the 45 degree line is, is, is black, which means that, the, that mutants that, are, that have a beta, of beta that's less than the resident will invade, which means the population will, will go, go down this way until it comes to this uh, level of beta that's marked with the dashed line. Where, where there is no mutant that can invade this resident beta, and that's our evolutionary stable beta, okay? And in this instance, it's, this numerical value is 0.32, and the important thing to note is it's not zero, okay? Um, so, so you get able, so, so, which means that the evolutionary stable motivations or objectives are other regarding, because they assign some value to the partner's payoff. And, and that's, that's sort of puzzling, because we don't have any we don't have any, you know, kin selection. There's no relatedness in this in this in, in this uh, model. There's everyone is strangers, and they, 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 it's just a one-shot interaction. But <coughs> but the reason that, that this, these other regarding preferences uh, are become evolutionarily stable is because of this response coefficient, uh, which um, which they create. So if if you can actually show that if if x2 is other regarding, if x2 has a beta that's not zero. This response coefficient becomes positive, okay? So this minus this fraction is a, is a positive number. And, and that means that, so, so this is negative, donating is costly, and this is positive, getting donations is better. So, it, so basically, if this, if this number here is positive, then this condition is satisfied at a positive level of donation, at some you know, high level of donation, which makes uh, which which provides benefits to both individuals, and then and if this is positive, then that means if you if you skimp on your donation, your your partner actually reacts to that, and then they they skip on their donation too because it goes in the same direction. So so that makes deviations from the ESS actions not profitable. So that's why it's ESS. Okay. 
So then, you know, given this you know, basic result, you, you, can, you can continue asking some other interesting questions. What, so, for example, are there, are there some interactions that promote more other regarding preferences than others? And it turns out the, question, the answer is yes. Um, and so here's, a, uh, here's one direction, at least, we've, we've investigated. Uh, something called, something biologists call synergism. Yeah. Uh, back to what we're seeing. Sure. Uh, are you just looking at, at, at small infinitesimal mutations? Or yes. I mean, what I don't understand is <coughs> if you are orderly guiding, what are, it seems that a big mutation which would produce completely selfish individual, that one wouldn't be, right? Yeah. Except if if you if, you know what 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 happens when you play against self, completely selfish individuals is kind of a boundary case uh, where you know selfish individual will will donate nothing, so your your payoff will eventually go to zero, which means that you know due to that product form your objective function becomes flat, which means that you know the this model is kind of uh, becomes degenerate in that case. So um, and Yes, we, we consider we consider small small effect mutants, which means that you know they're only a little bit different than the resident. Um, but but it, it does, you know like this pairwise invisible to plot says that I mean it, because the functional form that we assume are kind of they're they're nice they're like they're convex and, and, and concave in appropriate ways. Um, the, this model actually can can tolerate a lot of a, a fair number of big mutations too. But but the analysis that we did actually is all you know. Differential. So, but this this um, response coefficient. Uh -huh. coefficient. I guess the question is whether or not it would be additionally stable to have that kind of contingent yeah. response, as opposed to being, say, indifferent to what others. Do. Yeah, and uh, and and I think that you know the. The nice thing about this model is that the response coefficient actually falls out of the model. The response coefficient itself is a consequence of what the evolutionary stable beta is. What is a consequence of the beta. So if you found the evolutionary stable beta, that automatically means that the response coefficient is evolutionarily stable as well, in this case. So, but yeah, in general, it, 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 that is too, Yeah. But but it evolves through. So the response coefficient is, is determined by by this function x x1 and x2, and that's basically the resident. That's a function of the resident beta. So once you find the evolutionary stable beta, you found the evolutionary stable objective functions, and 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 therefore you found the evolutionary stable response coefficient as well. So but but as the as the behavior, as beta evolves, the response coefficient changes. That's that's exactly right. So. Yeah. So then the question is how do you get uh, beta that's sensitive? <coughs> um, yeah, so so again, so there's this there's this discontinuity in the model where, where you have where where, where completely uninterest where completely selfish individuals are concerned because um, because they will donate nothing. What no matter what the other guy does, right? So so their, their response coefficient actually ends up being zero, right? Um, but so, so, there, so therefore, uh, we, 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 would ha we have to make um, kind of this boundary case assumptions because the model is the model basically breaks down when, when at that at that extreme, the boundary condition. So, so basically, you assign everybody zero fitness because you assign that the interaction breaks down when you're playing against selfish individual because no matter what you care for them, they won't re re won't respond. So they and then at some point because your your objective function still has your own payoff in it. So if at some point your payoff will get so low that you, you stop caring for them as well. So then the interaction will devolve into nothing. Basically, so then if everybody playing against a selfish individual uh, has a zero payoff, and the selfish individual has a zero payoff as well, so it becomes neutral. But once we have, so it becomes basically, you can argue that there's some neutral uh, drift in the population. But once any you know, positive beta gets to any appreciable <coughs> frequency, mutant mutant interactions will take place, and they will have positive payoffs, so they will sweep over. So once you have so so just once you have slightly positive betas sweeping over the population, then uh, the evolution takes you to the evolution of stable beta but immediately. Early on, any mutinous playing against a bunch of selfish yeah. zero beta yeah. 
right? Yeah, so the initial... Yeah, so the, the initial uh, kind of in, initial invasion of the of of some parts of beta has to be true drift, right. and then and then once they get to appreciable frequencies where where you have mutants and mutants interacting with each other, right. two mutants interacting with each other, then you get them to sweep to fixation basically. Um, so we don't. I mean, so this model is you know like a standard evolutionary stability analysis, which assumes infinite populations and, and no drift, and so on. So. So in, a, in that way, this model kind of breaks down at that extreme. But you know, in in a plausible population, you will actually get get rid of get 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 away from that situation fairly quickly. Mutants interacting with each other sounds a lot like kin selection. Well, it 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 would be kin selection, although but but we don't count the relatedness effects. We don't count the inclusive fitness effects. So yes, yeah, so it if. The, the proper model for that would be actually a finite population model, and, and it will have to be stochastic because it's a finite population, uh, and you would have to enter, you know, count the effects of the indirect selection. But in this model, we don't count that. So, in, but if you, even if you don't count it, there is a direct fitness benefit, so that will sweep to fix, fixation once we have appreciable mutant mutant interactions. So, so the kin yeah, so the kin selection would also be at play there, but it's not required. Um, and the second model I'm going to present has kin selection in it, so. Yeah. You can put this off to later if you want, but how important is it that the, you the objective function is multiplicative? Good question, yeah. Uh, it actually is fairly important, um, and you know, I'm, I don't have the slides in, in this talk, but it's actually in the paper. Um, but it turns out that you know, you, you basically the question, the, the basic condition to get evolutionary stable, you know, the other regard is you, you get some sort of positive response coefficient, okay? And 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 basically, um, you can put you can uh, you can this find the sufficient conditions to get that kind of positive response coefficient. And one of the sufficient conditions is that the that the uh, cross derivative of the objective function is positive in payoffs. Okay, and and that's certainly a condition that's satisfied by uh, by the product form. Um, so there's kind of a synergism in the other regarding, or or, or actually, so you can interpret it as, as either synergism or as conditionality. Um, <coughs> but but what, what, what we can tell is, for example, and there are certain other forms that satisfy that condition too. But for example, in this model at least, um, the, the additive form doesn't cut it. So the additive form actually, of other, of other regard, where your, where your objective is your own payoff plus the other guy's payoff some, to some co and some coefficient, that actually doesn't lead to any other regarding preferences at the evolutionary stable outcome. So, so it's actually pretty important. Thanks for asking. Okay, so, and, and kind of on that note, uh, that's the other comparative statics result that we have, which is uh, if the payoffs are complementary, which, which is the economics notions, economist notions of um, saying that you, you need two types of inputs to produce, to produce the good, produce the output, produce the benefit in this case, uh, basically you expect more other regarding preferences, okay? And, and here are some you know, biological examples of uh, complementary or, or synergistic, which has been the, the term that you, people use in biology literature. Uh, so, so if you have, if you require both individuals to be there to to be able to successfully defend the nest against the predator by mobbing them, for example, that's an example of a synergistic or complementary input. But whereas if you if you have something like parental provisioning of offspring, uh, you might think that the, the those actions are substitutes because if one parent pr pr brings in more food, the other parent has to bring in less food, and so on. So, um, and, and the formal expression for complementarity is that the cross derivative is, is positive, of the cross derivative of the payoff function. Um, and, and here's an example uh, of how the evolutionary stable beta changes as you change the cross derivative um, from, from negative and be to positive and more and more positive. So, the evolutionary stable level of other regarding preference, uh, other regard, the beta trait, increases with, as you increase the complementarity in the payoff function. Okay. Okay, so to summarize this part, um, so this is a very simple and, and analytical tractable model thanks to a lot of simplifying assumptions that we made that, that integrates both the proximate and ultimate causation of behavior. And you get the evolution of other regarding objectives uh, the, um, through the behavioral feedbacks that generate. And, and we don't have any kin selection or group selection in this, um, in this model. So, so, and what's, what's, what evolves is not altruism in the evolutionary sense. And there's been a lot of discussion in this, uh, about this in the evolutionary literature. Know, how to define altruism and so on. 
but whatever you, you know, your position on that is, that's not, there's, there's no uh, personal fitness cost to other regard in this model, basically. Uh, that has to be compensated through, through kin selection, okay, through FX on relatives. It's all direct benefits. Uh, and then I've, I've showed you one competitive statics result that you can get from this model, which is that um, complementarity in the payoff function promotes other regarding objectives. Okay. So just to make some observations about this model before moving on, it's, this is a toy model. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not claiming that uh, this is actually a very realistic model of animal behavior in any sense. Uh, it's, it's virtues that it's analytically tractable. It, you can be expanded, extended, but it it's basically tries to get a, at the heart of this, of, a, of an interesting question by simplifying it. So, um, and, and in this model, the, the cooperative behavior is driven by, this evolution of this by the evolution of this trait that affects the motivations, the proximate mechanisms, the other regard. Um, and, but, so what we assumed in the model is that there, we, we, by design, we assumed perfect conflict at the payoff level. So if you increase one guy's payoff, you have to decrease the other guy's payoff. But then, but because of the way we set up the evolutionary uh, trait, the proximate mechanism, there's actually much less evolutionary conflict over this trait that evolves, beta, okay? That's why it's evolving, basically, because there is no conflict over beta, or, or le less, considerably less conflict over beta. So, so the, the, the puzzle, the kind of puzzle of cooperation that everybody wa wants to talk about, is kind of, kind of disappears here, because the evolutionary game is different. It's not the, that, not the payoff game. So, so I guess the, the, mo the morale from that story is that we, to, to, if you want to you know, if you want to ask an ultimate question, it's important to st state what the proxy mechanism is, because that will determine the nature of the ultimate question, whether there's a like, conflict over that trait or not, for example, in this instance. Okay. All right, so moving on. This was part one. And part two. So, <coughs> and part two wades into this big controversy about group selection. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't go away. Uh, there has been several resolutions and, and then several fra subsequent flare-ups in the literature of this, of this uh, debate, and, and I, as far as I can tell, some of the you know, m many of the remaining issues are you know, purely or mainly semantic. That doesn't mean that they're not interesting, but they're about you know, how to divide up things. But, but there are still some substantial questions in this debate that, that remain, and one of them is the original question that sparked it, sparked the group selection controversy, which is, you know, what does it take for evolution to actually lead to group, op group adaptation, group optimal behavior? <coughs> okay. So, kind of by way of definition, what is group adaptation? You, so I'm just going to define it as behavior that, that maximizes the total group fitness. Okay, so behavior that appears to be for the good of the group. Okay, and the, 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 the catch there is that, is that such behavior is, is, is in general not individually optimal. And, and this is the, game, again, the same game from part one, where you know, the individual optimal donation was zero, but the group optimal donation actually ma maximizes the difference between the benefit and the cost, right? So it's somewhere here, roughly. So I mean, there's, a, there's a significant difference. And so what, how, how on earth would you, would you get from, from this point to this point, okay? Uh, so this is kind of a spatial, spatial in instance, uh, a particular instance of the problem cooperation, if you will, okay? So, and so the, the current thinking on, 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 so there are two sides, you know, there are different sides of this debate. And, so the one prominent side is, can be, I call them the kin selection side, um, and uh, <coughs> there are, a lot of them are, are across the pond in, in, in UK. And uh, the current thinking on that side well, seems to be that, that group adaptations are only possible in general with, when you have clonal groups, when you have groups that where individuals are uh, perfectly related to each other, relatedness is, is equal to one. Okay. So, so as, a, as, as an example, the recent, there's a recent paper by uh, uh, and the Gardner and Alan Graffin in, in Journal of Evolutionary Biology, uh, which it looks at what what does it mean, which tries to explicitly, you know, um, formally connect the optimization framework to uh, to a population to a price equation framework uh, of selection uh, in terms of the the group optimization, and they conclude that between group selection can to, can lead to group adaptation only in clonal groups essentially. And, and they also say that mechanisms of conflict resolution, such as you know, policing or punishment, uh, they, they cannot be regarded as group adaptations in general. Um, and, and then they go on and they use these conclusions to argue that inclusive fitness is a more general framework than you know, um, group multi-level selection and so on. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that debate, but I'm going to ask, is, is these conclusions true? Are these conclusions true? 
So, and, and specifically I'm going to say that um, the, the framework actually leaves out a fairly important piece of the uh, puzzle, which is the, obviously the behavior responses and proxy mechanisms. And, and I think their main negative conclusions uh, stem this from this restriction, uh, among other things. <coughs> and, and I'm going to say that, I'm going to um, show, uh, or try to convince you at least, that group adaptation, or, or at least near adaptation, is possible for a much wider range of conditions than, uh, than Gardner and Grafen claim. And behavior mechanisms can at least sometimes be understood as group adaptations. Okay. So, and, and all this, again, hinges on this response coefficient rho, okay? And, and just because it does uh, hinge on that rho, I, this is what I said before about rho where, which is rho can, rho basic measures on average how individuals respond to each other, okay? And if rho is positive, it's an index. And so if rho is positive, then they respond to each other in the same direction. So if, if I do, if I go in this way, other individuals in the group go this way as well. And if rho is negative, they respond to each other in, in a negative direction. And if rho is equal to zero, they, the other individuals don't, don't respond to me. If I change my behavior, the other individuals' behavior stay, stays the same. And, and I think that's the implicit assumption in most models, most of these skin selection models at least. So, um, so and, and to, to, to make, to kind of build a more gen general framework in which to incorporate the behavioral responses with, the, with uh, selection in structured populations with relatedness, and so on. I'm going to consider the public goods cooperation game in, in, in that's played out in groups of and, and individuals. So, and, and again, the, the action A will, den will denote uh, how much you contribute to a public goods. And I'm going to say, so the, the public good provides a benefit B to all the other individuals in the group, except you, um, but it's, it's, and it's costly to you. you. So you pay a cost C. And again, the, the benefits and cost functions are similar to what I had before. And, and they're, they'll in general be nonlinear and so on. So, but I'm, because I'm looking at the uh, kind of an infinitesimal, I'm, I'm still going to use this infinitesimal uh, kind of weak effect mutant framework. I'm going to work with the, the first derivative of these cost and benefit functions. And so, so let's call them B for, for the benefit function and C, small c, for the cost function. Okay. And so they are, they are, those are the slope, slopes of these lines, basically. Okay. So then the question, the basic question is, when will selection lead to more contributions to the public good? And, and what I just do what a lot of people do in, the, in these kind of models and, and use the price equation. And the price equation is just a, a mathematical identity. Uh, and, and it's called the price equation because it was discovered by, by George Price in the 70s. Um, and, and it basically says that the, that the change in the genetic trait is equal to the covariance of that, of, in, within that, between that trait and, uh, and the fitness of an individual. And, and one way to decompose it is using standard assumptions of um, um, quantitative genetic theory is, uh, is the, to, to decompose it in, in this way. So to express that as a sum of the, the, the covariance between your genotype and your phenotype, which is PI, for a focal individual, times the regression coefficient, partial regression coefficient between your phenotype and fitness, plus the covariance between your genotype, the focal individual genotype, eyes, and other individuals' phenotypes, times partial recreation coefficients between your fitness and other individuals' fitness, and some over all other individuals. Okay. Um, so, so betas here are, are partial regression coefficients. They're, they're not other regarding traits, so please don't confuse this too. Um, and, uh, and basically, so, so what the, the betas are where these behavior responses become important, and 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 basically behavior responses are contained. So, for example, so be, be, the beta, the, the partial regression coefficient between your own payoff uh, or your own fitness and and your p phenotype is the, is determined. So, so if your phenotype is is for example increasing more uh, increasing help, uh, so if your phenotype is help helping or contributing to public good you will incur a, a cost C if you contribute more, okay? And, but, but then, if, uh, depending on how, how the other individuals respond to this row, you might actually get some benefit out of it because the other individuals might also contribute more. And there are n minus one other individuals in the group apart from you. So, so the total change is, is this sum, okay? Or proportional at least to that sum. 
whereas um, the, your, your payoff, the, the, the partial regression of your fitness with respect to another individual's trade is, um, so that other individual might, if, if they increase their contribution, then you will respond to them. So you will either increase your contribution as well, if rho is positive, and then in that case you will incur a cost C, so minus rho C. But then all the other individuals, the, all the n minus two other individuals, the, apart from you and the, the focal other individual, they will respond as well, okay, with rho, and they, they will provide a benefit uh, to you, and then uh, depending on whether they increase or not, uh, because rho can be positive or negative. And then this, this focal individual has increased their donations as well, so they, they do get a B from that as well. So that's, the, that's how where the, where the re regression coefficient comes from. And, uh, and finally, you know, this, and this is where the standard um, uh, quantitative genetics assumption comes from, you can define the relatedness as the correlation coefficient, basically, uh, between, the, between individuals, different individual genotypes. Okay. And so if you plug all these into a price equation and, and do a little bit of algebra, you can say that the higher donation level in a group of size n will evolve when, when this ratio of b over c is greater than this ratio on the right hand side. And the thing to note about this right hand side is that it has both r here and rho and here, but it's symmetric in r and rho. So you can exchange the places of r and rho in this equation and it's, the equation still same, stays the same. The expression still stays the same. Okay. But you cannot take r or rho out in this, of this equation and define a, you know, you know, an, an assortment term, for example, that accounts for both of them without losing generality. So you need both r and rho in this in this equation. Okay. So, and also if you wanna if you wanna check that, you can you can set rho equal to zero. This term goes away. This term goes away. This term goes away. You basically have uh, one over m minus one r uh, less than b over c, which is the Hamilton's rule. Uh, that um, for, for n players groups, basically. And if you set n equal to 2, that's the Hamilton's rule, basically. Um, okay, so this is, you can think of this as a, you know, Hamilton's rule with behavioral responses, if you will. Um, so then, so then you, the question that, that we want to ask is, you know, when, when will you get group optimal behavior? Oh, I should say, if this is set aside with equality, then the first order evolution of stable condition is is satisfied. Okay, that's the that's the first order ESS condition. So then you want to ask, when when is a group optimal outcome uh, evolutionarily stable? And and to, to ask that we sh first should characterize a group optimal outcome. Uh, so in a symmetric game with n players, the group optimal outcome will maximize n minus one times b the benefit minus c, which means that the b over c ratio will be one over n minus one. So you can you can plug it into the evolutionary stable co stability condition, which is what I just showed you before. And so instead of b over c, you plug in one over m minus one. And and it's it's real it's really easy to check that if you set r equal to one, um, so this becomes one. This becomes m minus two rho. So this becomes m minus one rho. The sum. So so you get one plus m minus one rho. And then this ca these cancel, so you get one minus one over m minus one is equal to one over m minus one. So the SS condition is satisfied, regardless of what rho is. Okay, if r is equal to one, but because it's symmetric, the SS condition is also satisfied when rho is equal to one, depend regardless of what what r is. So, so basically, either r equal to one or rho equal to one is sufficient for a group optimality by themselves, regardless of what the other is. Okay, so. So the, 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 the implication is that group optimality is not only possible for chronal groups, but also for groups where, where individuals perfectly you know, coordinate with their responses, if you will. They, they, they respond to each other to, as such that to make the rho equal to one. But you might, ask, you might say, well, that's still a fairly restrictive condition because you know, our rho has to be exactly equal to one. Because, uh, but remember, we, we, exact, we require an exact group optimal outcome. So, so what if you, if you relax it and say, well, let's say we want to just require almost group optimal outcome. So we want to come to, come to you know, within, within epsilon of the group optimal payoff, okay? So, and, or formally you could say, you know, we, we want to come within epsilon of the group optimal uh, B over C ratio, okay? So what, what would be the role that's required uh, that to, to, to come at least within epsilon of this B over C ratio. And, and here's a graph that, that answers that question. So there, there are three curves. So this, this lower curve is, is, is the, the threshold, the, the minimum row that you have to have 
to come at least within 99% of the group, opt maximum pa group optimal path. Okay. So, and, and this one is 99.9% .9 and this one is 99.99%. And, and as you can see, as related to this increases, you, you require less and less, uh, uh, a smaller and smaller response coefficient, rho. But even if relating to this fairly small, you, you can you, you, you get a you need still a you know fairly high response coefficient, but it's nowhere near one. Okay, so and if if latentness is you know moderate, you can get a, get away with a moderately high uh, response coefficient. So so it might actually not take all that much. Um, I mean these are kind of you know my my subjective uh, take on this, but it might actually take uh, so it's almost group optimal outcomes can be evolutionarily stable for a much wider range of. Uh, um, Relatedness and, and response coefficient values because they these tend to be these tend to reinforce each other basically so the interaction between relatedness and response coefficient okay so um, but then so the, so that's that's kind of the group optimality the the, the almost group optimality part but then um, Gardner and Graffin make another point uh, and this is related to to Ellen Graffin's um, you know a recent project of correct. Um, uh, connecting optimization theory with, with selection theory, uh, which is they, they in order to, they, they require to, to call a group optimal outcome an, an adaptation, a group adaptation. They also require that if you're not there, then evolution will actually lead you there. Okay, so if you're off the group optimal outcome, if you're doing if the population is doing something else, fixed for something some some other behavior, you will actually through successive mutations, at least locally, evolve to that point. Okay, and and. And this corresponds to a notion in evolution of game theory uh, that's called the continuously stable strategy, or CSS, sometimes also called convergence stable strategy, which means that, in our case, that, that means the, the selection will be positive when, when the contributions are lower than the group optimal values, and they will be negative when the contributions are higher. So then the, you, you want to ask, why, when is a group optimal outcome a CSS? And for that, so, so so far, we I haven't done any any proximate mechanism. So I, I was just dealing with treating rho as an index, that that is that kind of affects what DSS is. But to answer that question, you actually have to say state where rho comes from, because you you have to because the CSS condition ends up depending on how rho changes with the phenotype, how the response coefficient changes with the phenotype. So you actually have to model a model of that, and and I'm not going to show you the model that we did, but I'll just tell you what we did, which is um, we, we used, a, we, again, we used this goal-oriented decision-making mechanism from, from part one, and, but we changed it a little bit, well, quite a bit, to adapt to uh, public goods games where, where the objective function is actually a, 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 the, is a function of the benefit and the cost, public benefit and the private cost. And then I, I, we found the objective functions that uh, result of, in a row of one, and then determine whether these objective functions are uh, con continuously stable. And the big conclusion is that whether the con group optimal objective functions are CSS or not actually depends, ends up depending on the relatedness. And, and here's a graph that makes that point. On the x-axis, you have a range of, you have a parameter that, you know, again modulates whether you have a, a complementary payoff function, public goods public benefit function versus a substitute public benefit function where, where, where function where the inputs are substitutes. If, if nu is negative, then the inputs are substitutes, and if nu is positive, then the inputs are complementary, so there's more synergism going this direction. And, and, and on the y-axis, this, this curve plots the, the, the minimum value of relatedness that you have to have for, to make a group optimal outcome, outcome a CSS. Okay, and you can see that it's, it's Decreasing in the complementary parameter, but it's, so it's in general for this at least for this payoff function, it's, it's below below 0.5, which means that you know it le requires less than full set relatedness, um, and and it, it actually decreases quite a bit when if for highly synergistic interactions. Okay, so to conclude this part, uh, we I think the behavioral responses is it's fair to say that behavioral responses offer another route to group optimality and adaptation. And, and it is possible to reach almost group optimality with, with moderate relatedness and co combined with moderately high behavior responses. And then even in the strict, stricter sense that uh, uh, Gardner and Graffin are, are to defining um, adaptation, I think behavior responses or the mechanisms that generate these behavior responses of one, they can be understood as um, 
group adaptations depending on the relatedness um, and depending on, on, on the mechanisms actually. And, and that doesn't require uh, clonal groups by any uh, stretch. Oops. So, so here's the imperative. Uh, you shouldn't ignore the behavior responses and the proxy mechanisms. And just to, as a kind of a final observation, um, so my pa main point in, in, in both of these models is that the, the, the proxy mechanisms and these behavioral responses and behavioral dynamics, they need to be better integrated you know, thinking about social evolution in general because they do they tend to change our conclusions uh, fairly dramatically. But I should say that I'm not calling for more complex models. I mean, the models that I did were fairly, you know, toy, you know they're toy models, they're analytic tractable, uh, lots of simplifying assumptions. I think you can still make a lot of uh, gain headway with simple models still. And also I'm not saying that we should do it if possible because <laughs> the way I see it, we, we, are already do, we are already making assumptions about proxy mechanism whether we know it or not, acknowledge it or not. I, I just saying that it pays to be explicit about it and, and actually ex explore different kinds of assumptions. And with that, uh, acknowledgements, money comes from all these places, um, and uh, ideas come from all these places. <laughs>